we are in the middle of a genetic revolution, one which will change everything, one which could mean that all genetic illness and disease could be not just treated, but affordably cured. You know what the number one cause of genetic illness is? It's reproduction. <laughs> when we mate, we mutate. I'm, I'm not very romantic. <laughs> In the 1700s, farmers tried to take the guesswork out of this gamble by selective breeding. This is the beginning of the agricultural revolution. They realized that if you cross large male pig with large female pig, you would get a lot more meat for your mate. And this simple genetic formula of meat squared changed everything. It was simple. And this was before they knew about DNA. But what do we know about DNA? And more importantly, what have we left to find out? DNA is the Lego of our legacy. With just a few simple pieces, we can make very complex beings. And if you think of DNA as an alphabet, then our genomes are the language, and our genes, the words. Only this alphabet it only consists of four letters, A, T, G, and C. Now, it's not surprising that this language is complex. What is surprising is that in the 14 years since the human genome was sequenced, much of this language has yet to be deciphered. And that's because genes, like words, have more than one meaning and mutations are like spelling mistakes. Sometimes, a spelling mistake can make very little difference to the meaning of the word. Other times, it can be catastrophic. I'll give you some examples. Here is a present. Thank you. If we swap the E for the A, we get a very different gift. Hair is a present. Now, it's not always the change of one letter which makes the difference. You can have deletions, and you can also have insertions of letters into the completely wrong place. Here is a president. <laughs> but we can learn from mutations, and previously, this was our only way of studying disease. When a mutation occurs in the same people with the same illness, and we see the same spelling mistake in each of their DNA, we can find a cause for that disease. But what about finding a cure? Previously, we've relied on looking at these patterns in people to find the cure. We never really knew what we were going to expect until we actually waited for that to happen. Now, in the 70s, scientists learned that if you, you could put one piece of DNA from one organism into another. And this was met with both curiosity for the type of people who cared and concern. And maybe the concern was justified, was, but so too was the potential for progress. And in 1974, the world's first genetically altered mouse was made. This revolutionized our way of treating, studying, and learning about disease in a way that we could never do it before. In the 1980s, the first patent was given for a microbe which could eat oil. This was used to clear up oil spills all over the world. Probably the best use of this genetic technology was in our healthcare treatments. And many of the d treatments that we take for granted today are produced by means of engineered life, such as blood clotting factors for people with hemophilia, growth hormones for people with pituitary disorders, and even insulin can be com created completely in the lab without the need for animal organs. It can be grown in bacteria, which work as mini production factories. Bacteria are not just clever, they're useful. After this, we realized that we must learn more. And after this, we began the genetic revolution. So genetic engineering was born when we were able to put pieces of DNA from one organism into the next. And the current technologies that we use rely on curing by compensation, such as giving that insulin to patients with diabetes with diabetes who cannot produce it themselves. Or we cure by concealing, such as giving pain medication to temporarily alleviate pain. But what about curing by correction? Nowadays, we can use methods to harvest the tools that we already have and use these to better 
further our understanding of disease. In fact, most of the drugs that we use nowadays are manufactured with the idea that everyone's genetics is the same. They take no accountability for the fact that there are genetic differences between ethnicities and people, and certainly males and females. Many drug trials that we use at the moment were all tested on Caucasian males aged between 18 and 40. Even preclinical drug trials are carried out on male mice to avoid the estrus cycle and the hormonal fluctual changes in a female mouse. That means that true pharmacological interactions are not really being accounted for in sometimes over 50% of the population. That's a lot of pointless prescribing. But what if your prescription was personal, tailored to your genetics? In fact, bacteria do have a mechanism of tailoring their genetics, and it's called their immunity. Why not make our prescriptions personalized to each of our genomes? After all, the cost of genetic sequencing has fallen. The ability to read every single letter in the book that is you has gone from over a million 10 years ago to under a thousand now and is constantly falling. So what about these bacteria who can edit their own genome? Well, how they, how they work is to use it as an immune system. So we all recognize that we have an immune system which, is, which we need to fight off bacteria. But bacteria too need an immune system. And how this works is to recognize invading bacteria, cut it up and insert it into their own. Pretty useful. CRISPR is the immune system of bacteria. And its acronym explains how it works. It stands for Clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. Okay, it doesn't explain it. <laughs> but what it does do is it refers to the genetic sequence of the bacteria. And in these bacteria, there were pieces of DNA which puzzled scientists because they didn't belong to that bacteria. They soon discovered that these in-between pieces of DNA belonged to other bacteria and other viruses. And what they realized was these were the chopped up remains of viruses and bacteria that had previously tried to infect that bacteria. Essentially, every interspaced piece served as a genetic timeline for every infection that that bacteria had fought and won. And it's this fight that's of interest to us. If we can use this clever immune system to locate a piece of DNA, recognize it, cut it, and insert it into our own, then the uses are endless. Now, the discovery of CRISPR was far from overnight, but its global uptake and application were. And it's easy to see why. CRISPR is like the smartphone of science. If we can use this in the same way as smartphones, by updating our technology, we can maybe look to cure some diseases. Many genetic diseases cannot be cured. So you might ask, why should I care about CRISPR? What does it matter? Well, for the majority of genetic disorders and cancers and diseases, there is no cure. There's only care. Many of, even if we take single gene disorders, these are the disorders which are caused due to a mutation in a single gene. These are the ones which are most likely to be used for this technology or treated. There are between five and 8,000 monogenic or single gene disorders. And it's thought that together they will affect 6% of the population at any time in their lives. So even if we take this so-called rare form of genetic disorders, these will affect a lot of people if we could begin to understand and begin to treat. Monogenic disorders are only a small example of the disorders which could be treated. How it could work is in two ways. One is to treat the person who's already sick. The other is to prevent the illness in the first place. Now in the first, put very simply, we could take cells from a person, alter them, and fix them, and put them back in that person. The idea of doing this is not new. 
Gene therapy has been attempting to do this for over 30 years. And in fact, older mechanisms are currently being used. The first clinical trial has begun for treating a type of blood cancer, leukemia. How it works is to take patients' cells, process them in the lab, and about two weeks later, at a cost of 10,000 pounds, those cells are put back in that patient. And the results are very promising, but these cells can only be used for that patient. CRISPR could change that. Using CRISPR, we could take these cells, genetically modify them, and they could be used for hundreds of patients at a fraction of the cost and time. But just like a smartphone, CRISPR is constantly updating. In the last year alone, we've found more uses, we have refined its applicability, and made it more precise by sequencing the bacterial genomes of many other bacteria before. Ethics is a big problem when it comes to this. But we need to improve our technology in order to understand the repercussions. And maybe there could be none. Maybe they could be only good. Our understanding of genetics is getting better. The ability to sequence is falling. And the ability to edit has arrived. I'm not here to discuss the limitations, because not everyone wants to be better, faster, crisper, stronger. What I want to do is put it in context with some of the therapies that we already know, and maybe say that what we have is not necessarily good enough, and move you beyond caution to curiosity. I don't want to ask you if you're for or against it, but not necessarily for and certainly not against it. Because if healthcare was like technology and had regular updates, would you click ignore or accept download? I would accept. <laughs>